<laughs> Perfect. Well, quick welcome. Hi, Jose. Thank you for joining. So thanks everyone for being here, repping the Koopa swag because Jose and I work together at Koopa Software and I'm really excited to hear his talk today. So for those who haven't been here, I'll give a quick blurb about Jose and his talk and then he'll take it away. So we are going to hear about new developments and localization today. So we are blessed to have Jose Palomares, Director of Localization at Coupa Software. Jose is going to discuss recent developments in the localization field, including the role that AI can play in optimizing localization. He will also discuss how we as tech communicators can incorporate localization best practices into our authoring workflows, followed by just an open discussion of what we were um, what we've heard. Um, so a little bit about Jose. He is the director of localization at Coupa, the world leading business spend management firm headquartered in San Mateo. Born and raised in Barcelona, Spain, his trajectory in the localization industry spans more than 25 years as a translator, technologist, executive, and entrepreneur. Jose brings his combined experience from the vendor and buyer sides, a lifelong interest in technology, and an outspoken attitude toward how we can empower users regardless of their language, culture, or location. When he is not with his team localizing enterprise assets into 70 plus markets, he relishes learning new things, mentoring others, nature photography, cooking for friends, and not taking life too seriously. So without much else from me, hi, Jose, I'll turn it right over. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Yespin. And uh Aaron, Aaron Bio's awesome. They are they're absolutely awesome. So first of all, I, I apologize. I wanted to join a little bit earlier. I have a little bit more time to socialize before the talk. So I, I'm I'm sorry about that. I got a little bit caught up. Uh I hope that we can make it up and we can talk a, a little bit with the time for for questions and, and answers. And quite honestly, I don't know if I can live up to the expectations of what the talk is supposed to do. And if we can like talk about everything that is like running in localization, the same way that like, you know, out there in the world, hopefully, um, have, uh, hopefully I can showcase a few things that are like being very transformative in a Koopa for localization at the moment. And if you see, if you see something that we need to expand on, because I'm going to be like very light on details for a few things. Uh, let's talk about that later on. I want to impress you with the things that we're doing that are like super cool and touching upon is scary. So what I'm hoping I can do for you today is just say, this is what is keeping us entertained. So we're not going to talk about too much of the basics. I'm going to go for and show you what it is that Coupa localization team is getting. The reasons we used to not quit our jobs in the middle of everything that is happening out there in the world. So what keep us here? Uh, Jasmine, you might have to uh, allow me to share my screen. Oh, isn't that already? Let's see. Or Richard. Uh, let's yeah. see. You can you can share now. I think. There you go. Yeah, okay. All right. So let's pick the right screen for that. Uh, okay, not showing up. Trying again. All right. Hopefully you can see. Yes. You can see this is like awesome. Awesome. So like Jasmine said, I I manage, I support uh in our language we say we support the localization team at Coupa. And that means that we do a lot of things around language and adapting products and content. So this is actually a picture of what we do. And this is like the scope of work and why it is too broad to say to talk about like all the things that we do. So we're going to pick some of the highlights that are like really exciting. Sorry if it's too small, but it's uh, basically it represents this is this is the Venn diagram that inspired our logo. We have the logo of the of a pinwheel on the top right. And that is because we found at some point is like, how do we how we describe the fact that every department actually propels each other and that we are at the very middle, just trying to support everyone. So we localize the product into uh, uh, about 30 languages and 70 markets. And we do marketing, sales, legal, training, customer success, knowledge. So we touch upon every aspect of writing uh, that we have in the in the organization. And we, of course, don't go into the same depth for all of them, but there's nothing that we leave unturned. So 
that is that is a little bit where we need to, and we're like a very small team. So with this is the team at Coupa that supports this effort. It's about 11 people if you count uh, freelancers, only six people if you count FTEs. So we have to do this into a lot of languages. It takes a lot of like external partners, translators, translation vendors, um, copywriting partners, a lot of different people to orchestrate. How, so, how big is the company? So the company, so it's uh, a thing that I saw a count today, 3,100 people. Mm -hmm. If you if you rewind uh, six months back before we had layoffs, we were a 4,000 people company. So now we're going through that uh, wonderful transformative time of, uh, you know, having to do all of this with a, a lot less uh, people than, than before. But yeah, I think that in terms of like a structure, we remain a 3,000 people company. So the things that I could talk about today, I, I'm going to be able to showcase some of them with practical examples. That is one aspect of it that I would be like really excited, but I was told don't go and share, which is real-time translation for support chats. So we're, we want to talk about AI, right? And one aspect of AI or machine learning or, or just, you know, a, a, a personality within AI is machine translation and everything that it involves. In that sense, machine translation is something that we've been using for years at Coupa and that the localization industry has been taking advantage of for a very long time. So now everything is turning into AI, but we take it with a grain of salt. So we were already doing a flavor of AI before. We're doing it now. Now what is changing really is like the applications with large language models, as you have, you have uh, surely seen ChatGPT and the likes. Things are changing a little bit, but what people don't know is that large language models already existed and they were already used for machine translation. So the innovation for us is in how easy it is becoming to use it in the things that we do every day. So for instance, that real-time translation, we were able to translate things on the fly, but now we can do it uh, with uh, subject matter expertise built into the language that we use. So. Like I said, I'm sorry, I cannot show you that, but picture for that, that right now, instead of like telling the company, go and hire people in every region where we have customers or telling them, oh, the customers in Turkey need to interact with uh, with our support agents in English, because that's the only language that most of our support agents speak. Now we can have like a, a span, uh, sorry, an English speaking uh, agent sitting down, have a user just talking to them over chat in Turkish, having that translated automatically into English, presented it to the agent. The agent think about the response, the response back in English, and we're like back translating that to Turkish. So two dimensions of a challenge, technical dimension, how hard it is to implement that, and of course, the accuracy of that. The good thing is that with all of this, we're seeing like a reduction in, in the, uh, or, or we see a higher tolerance to mistakes and lower quality. And we see that it's changing a little bit about like, would you rather have nothing than to have something that is less than ideal? And I think that that is also a shift that is gonna be touching upon all of us, right? Uh, the fact that it's better to have something where you didn't have a human to do the job, is better to have something that the machine is producing than to have nothing at all. When you put yourself in the shoes of the user, it's definitely better to have someone who doesn't speak perfect Turkish as opposed to like be forced to communicate with someone in your less than perfect English. So the things that we're doing with AI is what I call ABCD testing. I don't know if you are familiar with AB testing. That's a very fairly common uh, user experience uh, um, approach where basically you show people uh, two versions of something and then you gauge which one they like better. So if you were, for instance, like creating an experience or a website or, or documentation and two different flavors of a template or visualization of the information or how to consume it, you could be presenting two models, gauge to, to, the, to different audiences at the same time, gauge which one is being more successful, driving more engagement, what people like better, what people read longer, what people are interacting more with, and then basically, uh, basically see which one is the best one to keep as opposed to like go into a full development a rollout of years and then getting it wrong. So we've taken that to, I call it BCD, just because we could do as many as we want 
And with AI, we're able to do it fairly quick. And I'm going to show you examples of that. So I cannot show you the first one. I'll show you something with the with the two ones, with the two other ones, at least uh, um, conceptually. And it does protect us from limitations on the systems that we use. And the third one, and it's the one that I'm really excited, and I th is I'm going to show you the workflows that we have to actually create multimedia content with uh, powered by AI with artificial voices that it, before we couldn't do in any way. And I'm going to show you why we couldn't do it and why it now is, is changing. Does this all make sense? It's a, me a lot of talking for an intro slide. I apologize for that. It's going to get better from here. Any questions so far? Anything that I said that makes absolutely no sense? So far, it's fine, I think. Yep, good so far. All right. So our concept of like heavy CD testing, I took, I took what we're doing with this is we're using AI to basically identify what is like the tone and the, the type of like voice and the language that we want to use in a particular region for a particular persona. So I took this into a silly example, but I hope that it does make sense. So let's take that bio that Jasmine so eloquently uh, read, right? It, it talks about me. It says a lot of things. It's not that interesting, but it, just some highlights. It says that it's, I'm a translator, a technologist, executive, and entrepreneur. Okay, that is why how I think of myself. And then it says that I do things like when I'm not with my team, I do enterprise into 70 markets. I like learning new things, mentoring others, photography, cooking, not taking life too seriously. This is how we speak. This is how we, I would talk to my friends, to people that know me. But now we can take this content and we can actually tweak it automatically. And it takes like one, like a second to reframe this and redo it for an audience that is like highly knowledgeable and cares about a much different type of language. So think like legalese. And in that same uh, variation that now we're able to do and do it in, in multiple languages at the same time, we can see if now that I'm not a translator on a technologies, I'm a linguist and a C-suite executive and an entrepreneurial innovator, this is just like making it up, but it still makes sense. And now I'm not no longer in just like with my team localizing, I'm orchestrating. I am doing, I'm working on corporate assets. I continue, uh, I pursue continual self-education. I do mentorship in tech and business, which I didn't mention before. I'm an avid engage, uh, avidly engaged in nature photography. Culinary experiment, experimentation is what I do uh, for cooking with friends. Uh, it's for my social circle in this, in this case. And I have a philosophy of approaching life with levity and a strategic thought. That is how we have transformed a voice that says, uh, you know, not taking life too seriously. These are things that might seem just like trivial or might seem like a game, but we're doing the same thing. For instance, we like marketing tone. How do we want to talk? There is, there is so many iterations that we can do this where we just can tweak this transformation and say slightly more formal. Change it for a finance leader persona. Bring this down to lingo that is like understandable to IT or simplify the hell out of it, summarize it, change it. Or in this case, just like write it for a seven year old. This is a lot easier. This is, this is the bio that everybody can understand. I have a cool job at a company called Coupa. I help people understand things in their language. Grew up in a place called Barcelona, Spain, and I've been working for languages more than 25 years. I'm really smart with technology work hard to help people everywhere, no matter what language they speak. And when I'm not working, I love learning new things, taking pictures of nature, cooking yummy food for my friends and having fun. Wow. So we were able to generate this in two seconds with like a pre-defined uh, sequence. What that means is like, you might have experienced ChatGPT, but ChatGPT becomes, or, or a similar to ChatGPT becomes the most powerful when you actually pre-do this work so that you can do it at a scale. So in this case, for instance, I did not just go and create three instances of this. What I did is I take one of our production scripts and tell it, this is what I want you to do for this text. You're gonna go and grab this text. So what, I, what comes next is my source. And I need you to create, actually I created like five different variations of this. I did like a, a, as extremely technical jargon 
actually, you know, I, I told him it's like make it sophisticated and 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 complex for an educated audience that cares about language. And then it created the flavor. I have one for a nine-year-old. I have one for a seven-year-old. And and one that explained, I tweaked this. Of course, we didn't use that in, in production. I created one that I want to show that said, how do I explain to my wife why I'm working late doing all of these things? And it came up with a bunch of excuses just to play with it. But in reality, we're doing this for, this is our original copy. Tweak it for this persona in finance. Tweak it for this persona in IT. Tweak it for this persona in procurement. Tweak it for regular speaker. Create social copy that we could use for that. And then we do either machine translated or ask that it creates it in a number of other languages. And then we can have an, an exercise with marketing, for instance, to just like look at what we think is the right or the best uh, copy to go with for a given campaign, for a given activity. I foresee that in the future, we're going to be able to do a lot more like personalization and give them, give each of those personas the content that they need, right? But right now, we're still at a process where we need to pick the one that we think will work the most or for, or, or for the most number of people and create the biggest effect. We have like pre-script this so that we can do it for like one document, two documents, 20 documents, 50 documents, and it will happen in a matter of like a couple of minutes. So that means that we can prepare a briefing with a whole marketing team and a bunch of regions just in a matter of minutes. Wow. It, it is a scary. It doesn't do the job for you. We still need to go through it. This is still gonna, there's gonna be like silly things like you saw the one in the middle because I tried to force the language to start to like make up information. Most of it, it makes sense. And that is a scary thing. Every iteration of something like a chat GPT is making a little bit more sense. It doesn't create false information, but you know, it's embellishing in a way that I did not do. So it's not only subtracting or changing, it's actually adding perhaps value to it. So this is one practical use. What we're trying to do, and again, this is tricky to, to show in, in this, is, this is something that we're only working on uh, as of like a couple of weeks ago, because now, um, Actually, this is OpenAI. This is ChatGPT. This is powered by uh, ChatGPT, latest version uh, called ChatGPT4 Turbo. This new version can actually read an image and find issues in the text in that image. So one application that we have for this is we have one scenario in which we don't have anyone internally who can go and, and spell check things like Arabic. We don't have enough employees who speak Arabic that we could use for this. It is very expensive to do it outside. And we just want to make sure that we're not just messing something up terribly, like maybe create introducing like a, a, the wrong uh, text in Arabic where we're like messing up the order. Because as you can you can tell, and I don't know if you're familiar with Arabic, but Arabic is like one of the right to left languages where you need all the elements in a, in a page, in a document, in, a, in experience to be swapped. So what you're seeing right now is like a mirror version of what our application looks like. And this is this is already an early adoption program. So it's not, I'm not disclosing anything too confidential, but uh, this is this has been a lot of work, but still we found ourselves with a situation. It's like, okay, we managed to do this. It seems to be working, but what? how do we know as we keep releasing this product now in years to come, that we are not making any silly mistakes, that something didn't break. So we started to like play with that new application of GPT that basically can look at it and tell me things like, oh, there's like duplicates on the page. It can identify the text and tell me, is there any word that doesn't look quite right? Is there any word that is like overflowing from the screen or that is like breaking into two lines? You can ask it a very long prompt, a set of instructions, same way, like pre-script, you can tell it, look for, grab this image and look for text that is like getting out of a box. Look for words in Arabic that don't seem to be sensical. A spell check the test and, pro and the, the, the whole text and give me a list of recommendations for uh, changes. Uh, tell me if there is like any number not, not uh, showing up properly. Et cetera, et cetera. All of these things is already able to like go and identify on an image. It scans it and it tells you a result. For now, that is one expensive and two is slow. 
but it gave us the ability to do something that we couldn't do in any way before. Before that scenario, we were going to either spend a lot of money to have like humans looking at this or not do it at all and just put it in front of customers. So this becomes that middle ground that where it's either we do this or we don't do anything at all. It's just, if you're not familiar with the Arabic UIs, they're like fascinating. Okay, so this is a practical case then of how we are telling our organizations that this is, uh, and please don't share this. This is, you know, it's good for, for sharing a real case, but I don't think that anyone would be happy that I disclose this. Basically, we had to do a bunch of videos for a website release. Our new corporate site was being like redone in Spanish and Portuguese. Unfortunately, at, the, at this time, after layoffs and everything, it is not so sensible to spend a lot of money creating voiceover for all these videos. But at the same time, it's our Coupa.com. It is our, our corporate website. We need to look good so that we continue to be successful. Okay, well, the problem with that is that it's gonna take a good chunk of the year and it's gonna cost 138,000. And that of course got a lot of like, well, maybe not right now. Maybe let's not spend $140,000 on this after doing layoffs. So we had to like get creative. So what we proposed and what we went for, we didn't ask for permission, we asked for forgiveness, is we just went ahead and we tried doing this with like a process that is like semi-automated with artificial intelligence. And, and the result looks like that. Actually, let me see. I don't know. Let me share again so that you can hear the audio proper. You tell me if you don't. Jose, would you like us to pause the recording for this section? Uh, that's that's fine. So I'm I'm done. I'm done with that. This is publicly available. Like I put on the slide at the bottom. So we're good. I'm not I'm not really okay. sharing anything that can get me in trouble. So don't, don't worry. Okay. I, perfect. I I appreciate it though. Uh, I'm just having a tricky moment with, there you go. Okay. Now you should be able to see it. And now you should be able to hear it. I hope. Veamos como Ocupa puede aportar valor a tu organización. En este video, veremos como la plataforma Business Spend Management de Ocupa ofrece todo lo necesario desde fuente hasta pago, promise, en un solo lugar. Revisaremos y destacaremos las capacidades de Spend Analytics, la fuente a contratar, la compra a pagar, la gestión de la tesorería y la optimización de la cadena de suministro. Sin más complejos, Cupa los ejecuta con el más alto grado de eficiencia. A evitar gastos innecesarios y a reforzar tu política de compras y dirigirá a los usuarios a tus proveedores preferentes. So I don't I don't expect you to speak Spanish, but I I hope that you can tell on, from the articulation that this voice is actually surprisingly good. It is actually so good yeah. that people couldn't tell the difference if it was just like uh, no. a Spanish speaking no. person that was just like following a script, or if it is really like machine generated. And we went to like create twenty eight of this in two languages. So the result is that the whole process behind this comes down to like $10,000 from 140,000. Why? Because we use AI to actually create a transcription. That is something that AI can do fairly well. Then we had humans review it. We cannot exclude the human from this loop. Then we created subtitles from it, which is something that AI can do. That is no longer, that's automated. You've seen it on YouTube but you can also have it in, in other types of like tools. Then we had like a machine translation, also driven, excuse me, by AI, a human review it, and then AI will go ahead and create the voice. We had like a catalog of voices that we can pick from. We can play with the modulation to decide if we want them to be like a little bit more cheerful, if we want them to speak a little bit like uh, with a higher pitch, with like a lower pitch, so we can tweak them in a few aspects so that you can control exactly what type of like uh, representation you want to have in the in the video that took two weeks end to end to go and do it do i want to do that for every single video and every single piece of content no 
But if I am faced, because there is risk, of course, it doesn't sound as natural. You cannot be funny. You cannot be uh, particularly emotional. You can know there is limitations to what you can do with it. But if it comes to like putting me in a situation of like not being able to do it for the user or being able to do it with a less than ideal uh, set of tools or process, I would rather go with that. I am a big proponent of uh, perfect is the enemy of done, right? Better to have it done than have nothing at all. So that is one successful example that I've been using the numbers to show around. So the next frontier of that, of course, is like I said, we picked a bunch of voices, but that as we were delivering that, the technology kept changing. And now this other thing is possible. This is a video Everything in English that we showed small. at our uh, annual conference. Every tower worth building, every crop worth growing, every discovery worth making. We started small with the idea of helping businesses do big things. From that beginning, we've built a business spend management community of millions. Procurement and finance, treasury, supply chain. So as you can tell, we pick a very particular voice. We did a casting. We picked the person that we wanted to represent us. This person goes on to be for the time being, the voice of our company. So you can expect to see more videos or hear more videos from this individual. But the problem is, how, what do we do when we have to like take that into other languages? What do we do when we need to like do an edit with this person and this person is no longer available? What if we need to like create a you know a variant or uh, you know or just correct something that it wasn't right at the very last minute? Do we need to like book them again in the studio and go through like the very expensive process that our marketing folks went to, or we could just use AI and clone them. Alles Große hat einmal klein angefangen. This is German. Jeder Turm, der sich zu bauen lohnte. Jede Frucht, die sich anzusehen lohnte. Jede Entdeckung, die sich zu machen lohnte. In person, who I can, Wir haben I klein angefangen. doesn't speak German. Mit der Idee, Unternehmen zu Großem zu verhelfen. Seit diesen Anfängen haben wir eine herausragende Business Spend Management Community aufgebaut. Beschaffung und Finanzen, Treasury, Supply Chain, Nachhaltigkeit, IT. Zusammen sprechen wir Dutzend. So every word that you hear that is just in English is because that's our choice. We have decided to tell it. You don't translate those words. In German, in German, we use them in, in the same. But everything else is like this individual now, in this case, with their permission, doing this work on their behalf so and of course this like opens up the the door to like a lot of like problems about who owns this and can you do it with people who don't volunteer their voice and how do we compensate people to take advantage of like their voices but the good thing is that you can do it with your own voice as of today there's a lot of like platforms there's a lot of like technologies a lot of people building that allows you to start doing this for costs as low as like a dollar per minute. So if you wanted to like take any piece of content and get it done with a, a varying degree of quality, you could be doing that right away. In our case, we need to be more careful. We still follow the same process that I described. You could, uh, we, we did like a transcription with AI, review it with a human, uh, translate it with AI, review it with a human, and then do the syncing and the voice cloning with AI can share the numbers for this one, but I can tell you, very efficient. A lot a lot better than bringing that person and teaching them German or having to find an equally charismatic voice in every region where we wanted to reproduce this. So, like I said, this of course comes with something that uh, for every organization you need to like bring up from day one. It's first, there's like security considerations. What's, what's happening with all this content that I'm showing you that went through AI? And who, what are they doing? If I use something like ChatGPT, who is, what are they doing with all of that information? I'm, am I giving them uh, more corpora so that they can like grow their own engines? Or am I not, you know, it, it, or is it innocuous? In reality, it's like, it's really dangerous. So you need to make sure that you have like a secure environment to do it or that you gauge what is like the security uh, degree required in your organization. 
So clear that out before you get yourself in trouble. It's okay to experiment. When you're going to like publish something, it runs into copyright issues, security issues, exactly. And if you're going to start doing this, it's like it, there are problems about like governance and who, how is it going to be done? What is like the procedure that everybody should be following so that you don't have everybody doing it in their own way? That is something that I'm I'm struggling with Cuba at the moment. It's like everybody wants to like do things, but it's hard to get us all under the same umbrella. And usually, if you do, it is slows down innovation. So what are you doing? Do you, are you happy to slow down innovation so that you can control security and governance? Or in your organization, it's best to be like fast and furious and just getting it done and then ask for forgiveness afterwards. And then none of this, no matter what they say on the news, none of this is cheap. So actually doing like all of these uses of like AI, of course, they are a lot cheaper than doing uh, studio bookings and, and things like that. But when it comes to like... Uh, text transformation, the cost, it is significant. It is a lot, it's a fraction of what it is to, to write the original English, for instance, but it's a still, I can, I can, I have like a, a clear point of comparison is everybody says translation is expensive and it is. Well, this is as expensive. Any of those transformations with any chunk of text costs approximately the same as translating that same text into French. That is a lot of money. So, Plane is cool, but you need to have a plan on how this this can scale up. Where, where do these costs come from? Oh, the usage the usage of like ChatGPT. The moment that you try to use it in a more uh, organized way, like through an API, for instance, those are not free. You pay if you're like getting segments in and out, a text in and out through an API, for instance, for your own implementation. You're paying for it. So the only thing that is like free is if you're using a model or a ChatGPT in its free version, which means you're not getting the fastest or the better. If you try to like have any of these solutions implemented at a scale, you're going to rely on things like building an API or connecting an API behind it. Like I said, so that you can have 10,000 pages of content that you can summarize or that you can transform or that you can translate. None of that is going to be free to use. And of course, if you want to like take any of that content and then customize for your own knowledge, for the knowledge of your organization, that is also going to incur costs for training that model. So there's like multiple avenues in which it's not, it's not uh, free. That is like the beauty of ChatGPT, that it managed to convince us that all of this would be uh, freely uh, available for free to us to go and enjoy. It's, it's true but only like the most basic of like versions will remain free. OpenAI changed their policy very quickly to start to like give the, the better solutions for a cost. So what I described with like being able to like read a screen and find uh, typos or, or uh, analyze even the sentiment on a given a screenshot, all of that costs significantly more. It's gonna be possible, but it's not gonna be possible for everyone. The same way that sadly, not even translation is possible. Did I did I answer your question? Yeah. All right. So, and this is this is what I've been showing my colleagues. This is something that uh, we're doing this in production, but I I want to show you uh, how we can like automate the whole process. Bonjour à tous. Je suis José Palomares et je vais parler de l'intersection technologie langage. L'intelligence artificielle révolutionne la traduction et la localisation. Des avancées majeures transforment ces domaines. La technologie change les règles du jeu, mais dans la traduction et la localisation, l'intelligence artificielle prépare une transformation disruptive différente de tout ce que nous avons vu auparavant. Does anyone speak French? Anyone here in the audience that speaks French? No one? I speak a little bit of French. All right. How 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 is my how is my French? Can you tell? I think I think it's pretty it's pretty decent, yeah. right? It seems yeah. perfectly synced with your lips. Yeah. So look at look at my look at my colleague here. This is my colleague Julia from my team, and this is her. Cześć wszystkim. Jak się macie dziewczyny? Mam nadzieję, że wszystko w porządku i że lato było udane. A jakie macie plany na resztę roku? 
Chciałbym dowiedzieć się o was. Cześć wszystkim. She's sending a message. She's sending a message to her friends in Poland. Chciałbym dowiedzieć się o was. Chciałem przesłać wam. Telling them that they're going to see each other soon. The problem with those two is that I don't speak a word of French and she doesn't speak a word of Polish. But we were able to automate this from end to end. So we actually, we recorded those two videos both in Spanish. And we do sound Spaniard as hell. <laughs> Hola a todas, ¿qué tal, chicas? Espero que estáis bien. Y que bueno, haya ido bien el verano. Y, y qué planes tenéis para el resto del año. Me gustaría saber de vosotras. Y os quería mandar este pequeño vídeo en plan sorpresa. Hola, buenas a todos. Me llamo José Palomares y me gustaría... And that's in Spanish. Durante un, ...un par de minutos sobre esta intersección entre la tecnología y el lenguaje y cómo los avances en inteligencia artificial están revolucionando los campos de la traducción y de la localización. La tecnología... I actually believe that I sound better in French, if you ask me. So, but the trick of this was, now the technology is getting to a point where, like, it is, it is really, like, almost like a deep faith. Uh, that you can do of your own off of other people it is actually so the technology here is doing everything in an automated way so the only part that will suffer from this is a little bit the translation so what is happening here is like i recorded a video in spanish and it got transcribed in spanish translated automatically into uh french and then it has scanned my voice to create to clone it it has scanned my face to read for, I have to like give it a few minutes of training so that it understands how I articulate. So it learned how I make different sounds. So I, I recorded like a five minute length uh, training for that. And I told it, you know, I was like trying to be very articulate and speak in Spanish because that's my native uh, language. So that is where I make the best articulation. It learned from that, learned from my uh, facial expressions learn from my voice, and then put everything together in one process. So transcribes, translates, scan my my face, scan my voice, and then reenact it. It learns all the Lego pieces and then put them together in a slightly different shape. I really mean it. I, I sound more articulate in French than I do in Spanish. So this is where, where we're getting. This is what uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Akupa, said, uh, witchcraft. It's getting to the point of witchcraft. So this this comes, I know, as a letdown, but I didn't want to leave. I know that I'm, I'm out of uh, time, so I, I apologize. But I really wanted to like fit in my asks for, please, dream about all these things. But at the end of the day, help me writing English that I can then take and fit into all of these processes because not every English or not every text that you write will make my life easy and make all of these tools work. So when we get like, you know, we can we can help ourselves uh, producing English that it's easier to localize, whether we're doing automatic or human involved or whatever it is. So these are the useful things that I ask for. Clarity, simplicity, consistency, avoid graphics as much as you can because we don't have a technology yet that can help us like reproduce it automatically. That's still like a very cumbersome process. In my company, we have like 30 languages that we need to support. If you create a graphic to illustrate an example of something, someone needs to like go and retake that in 30 languages. We haven't managed to do that to still in an efficient way. There is no technology being built that I know that will support that. And then I understand you might be confused by the British flag. That is, that is how I want to synthesize my ask to you. Write as if you were writing for uh, a cousin that you love in Great Britain or in, in, in the UK. Write your English as if needed. it had to be understood by a British speaker who have never been exposed to America. That means no American colloquialisms, no sports references, no army references, no you know, no examples, no politics, no, you know, think twice about the naming uh, a game for what we call it, uh, a sport for what you call it, like anything that looks like an idiom or a cultural reference. If you think that someone in your cousin that you love and care about in the UK will not understand it, or they might not understand it, that means that it's not good to put it down 
to later be used by users in other places. And therefore, it is not good to be localized. It will make people's life difficult. That is the best advice that I can give you. Don't think about anyone else. Don't think about the German or the Spanish or anyone. Just try to think about that cousin in the UK that you really care about. You don't want them confused. So that's that's this that's the standard translation advice that we've been hearing for many years. But what mm -hmm. now with AI can uh, can it translate uh, American idioms into British idioms or yeah. Polish idioms? You see, the, the cool thing about that, so thank you for bringing it up. The problem is that that is, in, in, from a technical standpoint, it is a fallacy at the moment. Because, and that is the perception. The perception is that uh, something like a chat GPT is as smart in every other language as it is in American English. But the truth is that it was built on information that was primarily and predominantly massively mm -hmm. American English driven. So it is like two students of English, one of them got to read all of the American English content out there in the internet. And someone learned German with only a fraction of that same volume of content. You cannot expect that they perform the same. So the problem with GPT and this and language models is that it will always give you a response. If you say, how do you say this in German? It will make it up if it has to. Mm -hmm. and give you a response. But it, once that you understand that they are not trained equally, you will realize that for the foreseeable future, that is the one thing they cannot do. They cannot help us with the multilingual problem, which is sad for me, because I thought that maybe this was going to be, it's actually sad and, and, and happy, right? It's like the fact that it doesn't work that great, it's, it's a good thing. I still have a job, right? But, uh, but it's sad because we could have solved the language problem. Unfortunately, it is like everything else. If you have like 80% of the content that you put in there was in English, you cannot expect that the Spanish equivalent, that that thing is going to speak Spanish in the same degree or have the same knowledge. So to give you an answer, you might have to do like the kids, my, my wife is a school teacher. You know, it does exactly the same thing as the kids do. She teaches the Spanish and the kids just make it up. When they don't know it, they just like make it up and they hope for the best. So that is exactly what it's doing in the other languages. I mean, it's really, really good in English and it's only going to get better, but we haven't sorted out how it will solve the language problem. So for that, we still have machine translation. We bet on machine translation. And to for machine translation, which works is slightly different, it has the same mechanisms and then some. Good English, it is an, an English that is like clean or as clean as possible from, you know, cultural uh, baggage, that is a lot easier to translate. So, and this is the only, this is the other thing, it's something that we're doing at Coupa, uh, which is like trying to go for inclusive language. That is something that just helps from a culture, cultural yeah. point of view and inclusivity point of view. And I'm happy that at Coupa, we finally has, we've been doing inclusive language in all of the translated languages, but we touched English last because we knew that people were going to be pissed. For all of the other languages, we do it, no one cares. We tell them that it's okay and they're just fine. It's like, hey, we've been using inclusive our pronouns in, in German for the last year and a half. It's like, what? Yes. Okay. So one complaint? No. Good to go. And what we told them is like, we want to change the language in English as well. It's uh, there is a little bit of like resistance because, you know, if you're like a technical writer, you know that you're going to have to do a lot of work. If you're like a developer, you know that it's going to be a pain. So, but we've, started to convince the organizations that some of the words, at least, they need to go. So this is, for instance, the first thing that we're doing where we have been approved to go and find any instance of uh, those words, white list, black list, slave and master, in product or documentation or training and go ahead and change the English, no matter who opposes it. So if you can do that from the moment that you're writing, which is like, it's the right thing to do, that would also help us a lot because it is really hard to remove, especially like terminology that is so ingrained like that. And it has like such a tradition and that people can still argue. It's like, well, you know, blacklist wasn't what you think it is. It doesn't matter. It is upsetting people out there. It doesn't matter where the origin is. It's, it's wrong right now, regardless of where it came from. So if you can do that, that is also facilitating the work of any localization team that cares about their users. So, Takeaways. 
we need a human in the loop. All of this sounds like uh, magic. All of it is like really cool. But you need people to run it, and you need to people to watch it, and you need to people to understand it. So it is a multiplier. It is not a miracle worker. It's not about doing less and removing jobs. It's about like increasing our productivity or doing things that otherwise would not be done. So it is a fertile ground for creativity, innovation, and seeing opportunities. And the personal take that I've had in my whole career, when whenever there was like a new technology coming up, whether it was like the typewriter or the or the computer or translation tools or cloud or whatever it is, is if you don't do it, someone else will. So I want to make it to retirement with a job. So I'm going to try and stay ahead as opposed to, you know, lag behind. And that's it. Sorry, went way over. No, you didn't. That's that's yes, you, you went fine. Yeah, and and that was very interesting. I I I enjoyed it. And if if people have questions, let let's let's put put them on the uh, recording. I was uh, I was impressed by the uh, lip sync uh, bit because <laughs> I I can remember the old days. I grew up watching uh, you know in art film houses watching. Uh, uh, foreign films that had, uh, uh, if they were smart, they just put in subtitles, but so often they went ahead and tried to dub them. So you'd have the, the voiceover would come out in English and the guy had actually said it in German. And, and you know, I mean, it's really subtle. You would think that you wouldn't know, but your it, mind, your mind really knows that that's not what that guy said. Yeah. And it, and it's uh, funny in my case, it actually, but but it is. So it is actually making me articulate with the position of my lips, especially in my case. So the Polish one is slightly different, but you know, Spanish and French, they're not, they're like, they have like some similitudes. So because I was like pronouncing and articulating very clearly in Spanish, it learns how I produce the different sounds. You give them enough samples of that. And he was really articulating. It's like, we had like people who speak French, look at it like this close, and say, holy cow, you are pronouncing French. He's like, I know, it's scary. <laughs> then it creates the sensation. It is it is actually happening. I thought this I thought the Spanish that I heard there was uh, you know actually easier to understand than a lot of Spanish speakers I've heard speaking because <laughs> you know I mean because the because the articulation is per, is pretty close to perfect as opposed to the way that most of us speak, where we sort of slur our words and, oh, yeah. you know. Yeah. And of course, all of this is a control environment, right? If you try to yeah. do that in a place where like, if I was like moving, like I'm right now, I'm standing yeah. for this uh, for this uh, meeting, right? So if I was like moving like that, it would struggle a little bit more. So we did a lot of tests. I have like a really scary one. I don't know if, if, if we have time, I can show it to you. But we did a test where like three faces on the screen Two, two of the faces on the sides speak, but the, the technology is actually putting lips in my mouth. I'm in the middle, and I'm the one that gets... Uh... Should I show it to you? It yeah, is... sure, go. Yes, please. I've heard the a lot about this one. <laughs> it is creepy. It is creepy as hell. So let me show you this. Okay. So let me share this. So you're gonna you're gonna see me <laughs> dress the same on a different day <laughs> with my wife and a colleague. So and we're the three of us were Spanish speakers. We happen to be in the same room and we decided to give this uh, a try. And we're doing it into Italian. So I apologize if any Italian is in the room where and you're gonna get offended right now. So you're uh -huh. not sharing yet. Yep. Yeah, come here in. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. So the challenge here is that the technology can only handle one speaker. And thank God that it can only happen one. But throughout the video, the original video, I do not open my mouth until the very end. Watch. Ciao, mi chiamo Sandra e ho 44 anni. Siamo qui tutti e tre per provare questa magnifica e straordinaria intelligenza artificiale insieme a un gruppo di partecipanti entusiasti. Prossimo. Ciao, mi chiamo Giulia e sono una 
Non so cosa sono, spagnola, svedese, forse italiana. Niente, sono qui. Non so se dovrei dormire o leggere. Sto provando questo prodotto di Hagen Labs. Ciao, mi chiamo Maria della Piedà e vengo da Cuenca. Sono vergine e sono venuto per vedere se prendo l'appartamento a Torre Vieja. Mi fa tantissima illusione. Sono un grande fan, Joaquin. So the technology gets so confused that he's trying to do two different complicated things. So oh. first, he, he has listened to the whole video and he has detected three voices. And he's trying to clone all three into one because it only expects one speaker. And it's trying to like find a modulation that matches every time where the speaker is speaking. So at the beginning, I sound a lot like the person on the left. And then I sound a little bit like the person on the right. And then I sound a little bit like a combination of the three. So that is like the cloning mechanism, which is just like listening to the samples and trying to make up what is this voice like. And the other one is that it's trying to do exactly the same thing with the with the articulation. It is, it's trying to pick my lips and then use the wording of other people. And, to, and it only looks a slightly better at the very end because we don't pronounce in the same way. We don't articulate. So it's a little bit scary. But at the same time, take drop all of that and look at a video where like the person Ciao, you know, mi chiamo Sandra e ho quar- their lips and speaking without really be speaking. <laughs> so it, it all being made up. It was creepy, but it was also like a, a, a good testament of like, you know, yeah. how crazy it can get. And the Italian, the Italian translation, that's another problem. It's like this technology yet is like we're we were like trying to automate everything and see, can we like publish this without like a human review? And the answer is no, we can. So that is why we cannot use it in production. But we by putting in the same uh, stops that I, I talked about before, like having a human in the loop, that is the 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 term that we use all the time, a human in, in the loop, we can all of a sudden I can take the CEO of our company and make them speak languages send a message to customers or prospects in other regions, keeping it like very short. So it seems like they have really learned the language or it will become like so perfect and so ubiquitous that people will just do it just to be nice. Like, hey, I took the time to send you this in this in this language. It's just like the, the possibilities, they're like overwhelming. That is indeed terrifying. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a couple questions from the chat. Um, Nikki asks, do you also speak Catalan by any chance? I do. I do. And I don't know. I haven't found any tool that supports Catalan yet. So (laughs) we're lagging behind. Fair enough. Soon, probably. (laughs) Sure. If, if, and, and that's it. That's the other thing is like, someone should be working on it. If they're not. We're missing out. I should be working on that. It's a matter of time. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, And then one more from Andrew. Um, What does univocality mean to you? A common vocabulary or a common tone? Just no. Yeah. So, uh, so some of those, but mainly like lack of ambiguity, absence of ambiguity. If you need to like rephrase something and in in 10 more words, but it removes any chance for ambiguity, that helps a lot. It helps a lot when you're trying to do translation into into 30 languages, and it helps a lot when you're trying to use automated tools. So it's, it's like simplified English or something like that. Yeah, so simplified English was like a, an attempt at it. But yeah, in some, in some cases, simplified English, for instance, uh, try to not be too verbose, right? I I would uh, I would rather take verbosity verbosity is that a word uh, verbosity over uh, ambiguity so it it is a similar principle but it can be different in execution mm-hmm. the thing the thing is it's always thinking about like oh is this going to be translated but never think it's going to be translated into the one language that you may be familiar that you have like cohabitated with or anything. Think about like, this is going to be translated into a hundred languages. How do I, how do we make it absolutely perfect, 
perfectly easy to understand. That is why it clashes with like some of like the values that sometimes I find with uh, talking to documentation and technical writing teams is that every organization has its own values and, and their own style of how they want to be writing. And then you go through a lot of evolution, but uh, it's the same thing to me as like talking to developers. Developers love concatenation and using uh, something as a wild card. I, uh, I write the house is, and then I enter a variable that says blue, pink, green, whatever. And they feel so accomplished because they were just like economical. But reality is that for everybody else except themselves, who is coming after, that is a problem. Because I I bet you in the 100 languages that come after, there's going to be at least 10 that have a, have a problem naming all the the all the colors in the same with the same surrounding structure you know colors might not have like a gender in english but they might have like different genders in different languages oh boy exactly mm. exactly so that's why i don't talk about the basics the basic is considered that like english has, is like gender neutral but some other languages have like 12 variations of gender mm -hmm. I'm not saying one, two, or three. I'm talking 12 variations of gender. Yeah. So, and and of course they use like different pronouns and they use different uh, declinations. They use a lot of like variation. So if you need to write uh, the house is of a given color in a number of contexts, you need to repeat that. Please write it every single time and then try to give yourself like a, a wild card. I used to be like very unpopular by telling people with uh, writing uh, certain t flavors of uh, user assistance to say, please, I'm, I'm not against conditional text, but if you start to like embed your conditional text variations within the same paragraph of the same sentence, you're turning that into a nightmare because whatever tool you're using, it's going to input that as the fixed structure plus all of your condi conditionals, right? And someone is going to have to translate the conditional bits separately, and then they're going to fit into only one structure. So if you need to create conditionality or, or condition, conditional text in your, in your documentation, please repeat that block X number of times as, as many variations as you have, as you have, if you can. <laughs> you know, this is, I know that that is a lot to ask, but when you think if we go with you on the business case, and the savings or, or the, the waste that it generates when you don't, I'm pretty sure that I can like show you a business case that say you're wasting a lot of time and money and frustration. Whereas you have the magic power to make it all go away. Mm -hmm. Kind of crazy to, to say, but repetition is good sometimes. <laughs> I think there's a problem in, in, in trying to pick words that have only one meaning. Yeah. I mean, That's right. English words have many meanings. Yeah. So I was, I was talking to, but you can try. So that's, that's the thing you can try. It is, it is about the intention. It is about, you don't write anything that you haven't like thought through. Or when you're reviewing or having like a peer review or whatever it is, or you decide to use GPT on your Google Docs draft, you ask it to go and try to find cases of like ambiguous uh, terms. And then you go like, oh, give me, give me a recommendation. What could be like a good, in this context, what could be a good synonym for that or a different way of doing it? And you may think, oh, that is like very inefficient. It's like, I mean, it's the same as your thought process once you get like super familiar to like have chat gpt as like one more tab next to you or on its own window so you can just like copy some text over and say i'm struggling with the sentence and i like having those conversations as such i'm struggling with this sentence and actually it does learn from it and tweaks a little bit of like adjustments because it detects my sentiment i'm struggling with this sentence i need it to be a slightly more concise and also i need to find a better solution for this term which could be confused with this, maybe something else. Give me the recommendations. Give me five recommendations. And then the thing will spit five of them. Oftentimes you will find something that gets you going. Problem goes away. You find better than what you had. Maybe you didn't find the perfect solution, 
but you are in better shape than you were just literally a minute ago. That is the beauty of these things, that we need to find where they help us go faster and be more productive. And my favorite use of AI and generational uh, generative AI is by far getting me over the blank page. When I don't know when to start something, I just don't do that anymore. I just go to GPT and I say, I need to write about this. Get me started. Give me like three beginnings. And from that, I pick enough inspiration to get over. It. And as you all know, once you get over the blank page, you just get going. Yeah. You'll come to something. It is just that initial kick that you need. Well, you don't need a friend anymore. You can just have the, the machine do it for you. And that's it. It's, it's dumb. It's not uh, intelligent uh, for sure, but it's there to help you. So take advantage of it. Okay, I think you have a couple more questions in the uh, in the chat. Can you uh, see that? I did not see. I saw a scary for boys over talent. It is actually destroying. I don't know if you heard, but uh, for in the gaming industry, Microsoft just like a couple of weeks ago announced that for any boys that is not uh, a primary role in a video game, they're going to be using their entire partnership with like another AI company that is going to be doing like voices with sentiment, so credible voices for gaming, so that they only use uh, human talent for. Uh, main characters. Everything else is going to be done with that. That means that the entry level to voiceover for gaming, which is one of like the big avenues in 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 uh, for voice talents, right? That is like going away. So there is like a massive uprising uh, against it. But of course, it's hard to stop it. That Why? was that was one of the uh, issues that came up in the writer strike mm -hmm. for the move for the mm -hmm. movies. But anyway, the movie strike. The thing was, is that it used to be that on a movie set, there were a lot of people on the set that were there to do patch up stuff and want everything, you know, and they started cutting down their budgets and eliminating all of those people from the set. Well, it turns out those people standing around were learning the skills that then allowed them to climb the professional ladder you know, so guys that had been sitting down as uh, as uh, dialogue doctors when they started were winding up being showrunners, you know, five years later. And by doing that, by kicking out the bottom rung of the ladder, they were winding, Holly itself was beginning to realize it was running up with a, running into a talent dearth yep. because it hadn't let anybody mm -hmm. develop their skills for the last five, 10 years. Yeah. And it, and it's a real problem. And and the answer that everybody said, everybody gives is like, well, you know, there will be like other opportunities. We just need to adapt. But that is that is trickier than it uh, that people care to acknowledge. But it could be, it could be done. For instance, you know, in with like the voice talent, uh, with the voice talent uh, people, uh, like I said, none of this is going to be cheap. So maybe you won't be able to work on Microsoft Studios, but at the same time, the technology is going to be available for you to train an engine with your own voice and be able to sell your voiceover talent where like you produce 15 times as much in a week as you did before, because there is nothing stopping you from like cloning your own voice for the boring stuff. There is nothing stopping you from like producing a lot faster when you can have like AI fix uh, issues in your own like uh, diction or in your own like pronunciation. So there's gonna be ways, and there's gonna be a whole market of people who couldn't afford to do like, like myself at Koopa, I couldn't do that project with $140,000. But if yeah. if uh, if if I get voice talents that are like significantly cheaper because they produce a lot more, I will be willing to talk to them because what they can give me is still better than what I can get from the machine. And it will continue to be, you know, there's always like a, 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 a catch up, catch up, Catch you into a situation. No, I so, totally I understand what you're saying because even in my own writing, the the drudge work is getting the first draft, but my skill all comes in on what I do after I've got the first draft. You know, the real writing, the real talent 
is all in the editing. And the only reason to produce a draft is so you have something to edit. And if something else could come along and produce a first draft for you, that would help a lot. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, Darryl. can you uh, can you see the uh, chat, Jose? Uh, I do. Yeah, I wasn't scrolling through, uh, but I can see it. Okay. Yeah. So there were a bunch of questions in there. If you want to pick them off, or if you're uh, tired of talking, we can stop. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so. I saw one about like what's the language with like 12, uh, 12, uh, 12 genders. I think that it's, uh, I think that the record is uh, uh, Bantu, which is like a spoken as, uh, you know, or, or Swahili that has like about 15 different differentiations for gender. So I, I think that also there is like Hungarian who gets to like uh, nine or 11 different declinations for gender. So it's not that they have like that many genders; they have like that many denominations of gender. So I should, uh, I should correct that. Uh, yeah, and Estonian there, has fourteen cases. And there's probably and not a real, a real big base of Swahili or those other languages to train your AI on either. Yeah, well, uh, that's that's uh, that's another big conversation. We call it like low resource languages. It's, it goes back to what we were saying about like you use ChatGPT and you think that uh, Spanish or German will perform as well as English. Truth is they're like training a much smaller data set. When we go to languages that are like minority languages, that drops to the floor. There is not enough content uh, digitized online available for us to grab of decent quality for us to like create even anything similar. So there are conversations about like, how do we create data artificially to train models now? How do we uh, help people create more like conversational data from scratch? How do we find or how do we digitize whatever content it's out there in the in the world in, in a form that is not digital yet? So all of those things, because otherwise there's gonna be like a two or a good third, and a, a third of the, of the globe that is gonna be uh, on hold in taking advantage of all of this magic technology that we have. And we know who's going to get the short end of that, right? So they're going to be left behind again. So usually usually the good thing is that uh, those languages and those uh, those countries tend to do what is like a, a technological leapfrog. They have been behind, but hopefully will come out. They have, they have been skipping a lot of like the technology in between, and now they will get on hard with AI and jump to a level where like they're producing their own data so that they can catch up to where the others are. But we, of course, need to help them. Uh, what else? Uh, has text translation moved beyond cost per word and towards cost per time? That's We are having a very heated conversation about that right now. It is, it is mostly still like cost per word. And only a brave few is trying different uh, models, which could be, you know, uh, just uh, I'll pay you to get this done a fixed amount, and then you do whatever you have to do. Because otherwise, it's like, why would I pay you like per word when I know that maybe you're using AI and machine translation and something else, and you're really not spending that much time or whatever. So one way to remove all of those like uh, nuances is to just say, I'm going to just pay you for the finished product, which is tricky for people to accept, but it's how it works, for instance, in in marketing. Marketing agencies, they just show you a menu. This is what it costs to create a blog post. They don't say it's gonna be exactly 282 words and it's gonna cost this much. They say it's gonna be a blog post that, that fulfills this need and it's gonna cost you X. And then we have a look at it and we say, oh, it doesn't work. We're gonna tweak it a little bit and we don't charge you again. Oh, you want it completely different? We're going to charge you again for the whole thing. And what I use on my side of things, what technology I use, that is push onto you as the writer, translator, localizer, whatever it is. It's, I don't care what you're using. That's, but, but it's a great question. It is, it is a struggle and it's not happening quickly. At Cuba, for instance, we do have a hybrid model where we pay a lot of things for per work and a bunch of other things we pay them, we pay them per item. And then we just have this uh, tacit agreement of 
if you produce something that is, of course, not great, you're going to have to tweak it a little bit. Once we nail it, you can produce it at a scale or or uh, in, in in a serial way, then we're good. Everybody needs to make money. All right, I'm, I'm going to stop the recording uh, now uh, and then we can keep talking if you, if you want to keep talking. But thank you very much. This has been a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad I'm glad that it's a little bit I hope it's a little bit useful. If your your faces show 